Welcome to the Writer Center's virtual craft chat series where we chat with authors a little bit a little bit less about what they wrote and a little bit more about how they wrote it. My name is Zach Powers. I'm the artistic director at the Writer Center, which is great. More importantly for today, I am a fiction writer and a novelist, so uh, I will be switching to my writing hat to talk writing a little bit with our guest today, who is the author of this really amazing, wonderful, surprising book, The Sham Shine Blind. Has Pardo, thank you so much for joining us from Buenos Aires today. Uh, I think you you might set the record for the longest login for a virtual craft chat and uh, chatting beforehand has been a delight already. And I'm really, really looking forward to the conversation. Uh, but up first, you have an excerpt, I think, to share with us so that everyone has a taste of what we'll be talking about. So if you would please read your excerpt, maybe introduce it if you have a little information to share beforehand. Yes, so I'm gonna read a piece that's from about a third of the way through the book. Um, and I'm going to have to describe the book a little bit before I read the piece so that everybody can follow along. Um, because The Shamshine Blind is set in a world in which Argentina won the Falklands War in the 1980s using psychopigments, which are like colors that make you feel things. So it's like paintball, but for feelings. And this excerpt that I'm reading uh, has a lot about psychopigments. Um, the book follows Kay Curtita, who is working in the Psychopigment Enforcement Agency, um, which is the American government's uh, attempt to regulate these psychopigments 30 years after the war has ended. And she has been chasing down um, a, a batch of shamshine, which, so these psychopigments are used in, in the same way that we use antidepressants. Um, they're used everything from street drugs to weapons to, you know, pharmaceuticals. And so depressives take sunshine yellow every morning and shamshine is fake sunshine yellow. And so she has spent all of the book trying to track down the crooks with the shamshine. And she has just heard that they know where they are and she's gone up to try to catch them. Um, the other thing that you need to know, the book is set just south of the ruins of San Francisco which was devastated in the late 80s by uh, a bunch of an anachronistic hippies who wanted to turn it into the real city of love. And so they blasted it with magenta, um, which they think of as, they thought it would make everybody fall in love, but really it causes an obsession more akin to teenage fandom. This is so much information for this excerpt. I promise you it makes more sense in the book. <laughs> um, so she's going to end up driving up into San Francisco during this excerpt. So I tore off down the street after the driver of the Topolino. He backed onto Mission and then shot forward. We went on a nice joy ride through the neighborhood. I got to see the light rail station, the freeway, and a lovely pocket-sized park before he turned north, heading toward the San Francisco border. I pushed the Renault up onto my quarry's tail as we flashed past the pigment warning sign. Now entering magenta territory, your feelings may not be your own. It's impossible to anticipate the, Im the impact of driving into a ruined city. I'd never known San Francisco in its heyday, but I could see how far it had fallen. Once grand Victorians gutted by fire, earthquakes and mold watched like fallen angels over the pitted streets. The few left intact stood shamefaced for their sagging roofs and pitted facades. Garbage moldered in sweaty piles or crawled along the sidewalks bearing its obscene entrails. I braced myself for the effect of the lingering pigment, but the wave of obsession hit me with surprising force. Get him, get him, get him. The speedometer needled up to 60. We raced through the rubble, jouncing across potholes and pigment spills going stale under the full moon. The magenta bomb hadn't been the only pigment disaster in the city, just the biggest. My emotions went haywire. By the rubble of City College, the mix of the pink with an old cerulean guilt spill had me dwelling on the memory of my father's face when he caught me using dirty words with a friend. His tone of voice making my eight-year-old self think he'd never see me the same again. As we turned east onto the remains of Alamany, a cobalt patch brought back the feeling of packing up Walter's office after his suicide. Gaunt figures flickered in the night, lit by burning trash cans. Two people fought under a guttering street lamp, the only sign of electricity for miles. Under everything, my focus throbbed, burned, oozed. Get him, get him, get him. A rusted cable car sagged in the crossroads at Mission and Dolores. I was overcome with a crying jag. The Fiat slowed. My mark was feeling the storm of sentiment too. Good, I sobbed at the steering wheel, stomping on the gas. The gangster heard my motor roar. The mousy little car jumped forward, scurrying up Dolores. 
I wiped my eyes and shifted into a higher gear. We veered across the broken street, dodging the debris of dying palm trees. Our engines screamed with the effort of climbing the steep hill. We were headed straight toward Dolores Park, the epicenter of the magenta attack. The longing in my stomach grew with every block. I imagined it as something unconnected to me. It was an old agency technique Walter had taught me to separate myself from the effect of pigments. The yearning was a tiny creature with big teeth that just happened to be chewing on my rib cage. The squawk of the, road, radio, the, squawk of the radio broke my focus. It was Doug checking in on me. Getting close, I muttered when I got the crook. I'd hold him so tight he'd have no idea what hit him. I'd fold him into a little ball, squish him so hard he'd fit into a can. I'd carry him around in my pocket, a demented jack in the box. You doing okay there? I pushed the magenta creature to one side of my mind. Still on the Topolino's tail, I said, and clenched my teeth, 25th and Dolores. Through a crackle of static, I could hear Tommy and Meekins talking over each other as I crested the hill. You're in San Francisco, Doug said. Kurpita, are you crazy? You suffered a pigment attack this morning. You're going to be much more susceptible. The Topolino slowed, pulling up to the corner of the park. I got him, I said, zooming toward the Spiat. You're mine now, you little... <gasps> Out of nowhere on the sidewalk, a pair of headlights appeared, floating in darkness. They pulled out into the street, the automobile they were attached to nothing but a stain on the night. The moon glinted off the cracked windows of the townhouse in the background. The door of the Topolino opened and the driver disappeared into the getaway car. The black vehicle came racing toward me. What's happening, Doug asked. I yanked the wheel to the left, crashing over the center divider. Ninja? A pale hand appeared out of the driver's side window, holding a pigment dart gun. My breath caught. A finger settled on the trigger. As the barrel of the gun turned my way, my lizard brain took over. Pedal to the metal, I steered the car over the sidewalk. A flechette whined behind my bumper and thudded into the crumbling Victorian townhouses on the corner. The dark pit of the park spread beneath me, littered with rubble and human refuse. The panorama of the wasted city opened in the distance. Fires burning on the tops of abandoned skyscrapers and the festering remains of the financial district. My poor Renault skidded down the park's dusty dunes, narrowly missing an overturned porta potty in a small playground. She settled with a groan in a pile of dry palm fronds at the bottom of the hill. I killed the engine, unbuckling my seatbelt. He's gone. Some sort of freakish getaway setup. They had a pigment gun, but they missed me. I'm going to check out the Topolino. Get it. The animal was gnawing on my insides. Doug's voice cracked across the radio. Why would you, the magenta saturation in that area is strong enough to bend brains for another 50 years. You're not thinking straight. I opened the door. A Topolino could be crushed into a can too. What did the pigment gun have in it? If they missed you, it'll be splattered all over. Doug's voice faded behind me. Up to there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad you, that was, I. I'm glad you read that because I feel like it's going to set up everything we're going to talk about soon. So, but to get started, though, for our for our guest, in your own words, who the heck are you? <laughs> who am I? I am I originally a playwright. Uh, the Shamshine Blind is my first novel. Um, I generally write things that border on speculative, that bend genre, um, that pull from everything from noir to science fiction to the year of psychoanalytic training that I did once, because why not? Um, I'm interested in work that plays with form, generally both in theater and in fiction. Great. So this novel and what you just read, I think is a great example of where I'm starting my questions is this novel is sort of a study of emotions through the fictional conceit of pigments which were well introduced just then. So I don't feel like I need the back. I'm glad that was done. I have to explain them now. So oh, was, this, was this concept, the concept of pigments, the original spark for the novel or was it something that emerged after some element or other idea? So the like very, very first inkling uh, in 2012, I wrote a weird poem thing, speaking of fiction writers needing to read more poetry, um, which was a recipe for pickling hope. Um, and I really enjoyed the idea of being able to capture an emotion in some way and like save it for later. Um, and then in in 2014, um, I, I had this image of a woman in 
in a wedding dress in a motel room, uh, lying on a bed, fully clothed with a man who was not her husband. Um, and she, I was like, she's chasing pickled hope. And I was like, what is this? <laughs> Where did this come from? How did it, how did they get here? What is happening? Um, and that was sort of the genesis of, um, of, of where it all came from. Um, and it very much like very quickly, I, I, I read a lot of noir and had a lot of, um, sort of interest in the detective genre in terms of how you structure a book. Um, and so I, I decided that I wanted it to be, to have a story and to have the, the case that she's chasing. Right. Um, and then that ended up being a really useful way to explore because the main character, Kritita, um, has a very, um, she represses her emotions a lot. Like that's one of the things in the book is that everybody, all of these agents have to be depressive because depressives can repress their emotions so they can handle getting these emotional attacks. Um, but then that of course screws them up in other ways. And like the typical noir narrator always like they're, they're masters of repression, right? Um, like if you think about Sam Spade, um, that it's not exactly someone who's in touch with their feelings. Um, so it ended up being a really nice sort of a way to, to explore, um, a, a character who, who intrigued me more than just in terms of the plot, but sort of in terms of who she was and how she was dealing with the world. So you mentioned the structure based on, you know, you're interested in the detective novel structure and then the detective novel trope of the tough, gritty, emotionless narrator. But this is a narrator who maybe is sort of emotionless, but also forced to confront emotions regularly through the concept. So I'm wondering how this strong concept affected how you plotted and structured and how maybe it pushed you out of maybe the confines of the the tropes into something new and more interesting because it absolutely goes in that direction. Yeah, I mean, it was actually, it became, because it's first person. Um, and when you have a first person narrator, narrator who's really good at denying their feelings, it becomes, it became a big challenge to try to figure out how to let the reader in on what she was trying to hide. And it actually turned out that the pigments were a huge blessing that way because she's regularly put in these situations where she's just totally overwhelmed. Uh, with feeling. And so that allowed me to sort of get under the mask and crack her open a little bit in a way that I don't think that she would have wanted me to <laughs> in another situation. Um, and, and it was also really fun to play with, like, then also how she, how she reflects on those experiences that she has had with pigment as well because she's very she's very good at being like oh well everything i'm feeling is because i'm in a world that's saturated with foreign emotion um so she sort of even though the pigment forces her to feel things she uses it as yet another way to deny what is going on inside of her so i mean we there's large scale things happening in this book due to the conceits of the novel but also, how, what, what, are there any little things that maybe popped in as you're writing this? I feel like the things that maybe you discovered that you didn't like, oh, this is fun. And, and you, uh, maybe talk about this in other ways a little bit later. But just like what little things emerge from how did the world develop unexpectedly in small ways from the conceit of pigment or maybe some of the other conceits that are driving the novel as well? Well, so one of the one of the big ways that I had to discover the world was because so I came up with this idea of pigments and then I was like, oh, who would have developed, who would have weaponized emotions? Like who in the world would do that? And Argentina has the highest density of psychoanalysts per capita in the world, uh, Buenos Aires specifically. And so I was like, oh, well, clearly it would be the Argentines who would do that. Um, <laughs> and then um, also there's a lot of the, the Falklands War is still a big, um, like, political talking point down here, like we're 30 years out, but it's still very much part of the political discourse. And so I was like, well, what if, what if they went, won the Falcons war? And actually a lot of the unexpected stuff came from just making that choice. And then these little things would happen where it would be like, oh, if, 
like living down here, I see how culture from the States arrives um, and how culture here is in dialogue with this imported, you know, the, the, the culture of the empire in some way, right? Um, and so I had a lot of fun imagining inverting that relationship and how that would have changed um, changed the world. Um, so like with music, like like also like Madonna's big break was in the mid eighties, right? But the the war would have been happening at that time. So Madonna becomes like a footnote who just gets mentioned, you know, at one point. And on the other hand, like. Argentine musicians um, or, or Latin American musicians have much more influence on the music that's being heard on the radio um, in the States. And that was that was a lot of fun. Um, and then also thinking about like, I mean, I'm very much thinking about music right now. So like there's a band called the Dead Sentiments, um, which like that very much came out of like what 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 would musicians be grappling with in a world where your feelings are often not your own? Yeah, I, I loved. I, I noted the Madonna moment in my notes that she appears as Madonna with a full name, which I can't remember because no one knows Madonna's full name except if recently read the book. But yeah, so that was just like that was one of those moments. Like, oh, there's there's lots of little small level things going on, and I love the I I love the way those go. Um, related to the small moments, though, I think is a sense of play and something I also call seriousness versus respectfulness. Um, I, I think you can be unserious, but sort of respectful to your topics. Um, uh, it feels like you enjoy the process of writing. It feels like you enjoy finding those little moments and placing them. It, you're nodding, so I can assume that is an accurate statement. You, you do enjoy that process. Yes. Um, yeah. So how do you transfer that energy from the process onto the page? Why is that, is that energy important for you as a writer? Is that something that energizes you to keep moving forward? Yeah, I think I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gotten through, especially the first draft without that sense of play. And in a way, like, the first draft was much sillier, like, just literally, like, pages of silly banter that nobody except me was ever going to enjoy, right? Um, but, it, you know, I'd be sitting at my computer and make, you know, cracking myself up. Um, and so then, it, then the process of revision became keeping that joy alive, but also respecting the reader's time and energy, but also the characters, because as the characters became, as, as I got to know the characters, as I wrote version one and version two and version eight of these people, um, I started having to grapple with more of what they would, how they would actually be reacting to these situations. And one of the things that, that became, that went from like a ha ha to, like, okay, this is a funny concept, but now I have to respect what I'm dealing with was that if Argentina had won the Falklands War, then the dictatorship would have stayed in power. And the I had Argentina as the sole superpower in the world. And all of a sudden, the sole superpower would be a dictatorship model that committed brutal acts of terrorism against its uh, against its civilian populace in an attempt to sort of enforce an idea of order and the fam the importance of the family and sort of a ca traditional Catholicism. Um, so that having realizing that that was a consequence of this like fun choice that I'd made made me realize that this world had to be darker than I had maybe originally thought. And realizing that the world was darker then also allowed me to crack open the characters in a new way and say like, okay, like, what does it mean if the empire is this very, like, strongly um, conservative, uh, reactionary, his reactionary is probably a better description um, for someone like the Curtita's assistant cadet sidekick character is Tommy, and he's gay. And, you know, what does that mean about how would, how would AIDS have played out? And how, what would that mean for his expectations about his life? All of a sudden I was facing real crises for real characters as opposed to just like, oh, well, he's the one who's always happy-go-lucky and always making all of the jokes. Um, and in a lot of ways that then became, it, the, 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 the fun and the playfulness got me going and then 
gave me the material that allowed me to complicate the rest of the book in a way that then kept me working on it. I mean, it was eight years from first draft to publication. And so that was, both of them were important. Uh, so on, on that, so we had a lot, how long it take was, was eight years. Uh, and another question from the chat right now is how many drafts was this before found this current version? It's depending on how I count it, it's either seven or eight. Mm -hmm. Um, it was about a draft a year. Um, I, I was really lucky because I managed to get a draft together before I got into grad school. And so then I had the three years of grad school to like, you know, take a workshop and then take those notes and do a rewrite and then take another workshop and take an independent study, um, which was really important. But then at the end of grad school, I found, I, I signed with my agent and she, I was like, yeah, I think, you know, I'll finish this draft I'm working on. And she was like, great. And then I'll read it. And then hopefully we'll go out on submission. Um, and then I sent her the draft that I'd finished and she goes, so it's supposed to be a thriller and the last third just isn't really thrilling. <laughs> so I had to re do an entire rewrite of the final third um, and then and then another rewrite after that. Um, and then we I we went on submission and my editor bought it and then he read it and was like so it's supposed to be a detective novel and she doesn't really do any detecting in the first third <laughs> so i had to rewrite the entire first third with him um so it was yeah it was i signed i signed with my agent in 2018 we went on submission at the end of 2020 and then it was a year of rewrites uh with or uh, no a year and a half of rewrites with with um, with Peter by the time everything my editor once everything got sorted out contract wise and all of that. What a terrible industry we're in. Um, <laughs> uh, so back to the previous comments, so I, I was just really interested in a couple of things you mentioned bringing in the darker tones. You're discovering the darker tones along the way, but I think it's really interesting how the playfulness like when two thing, when two different styles or two different elements butt against each other, there's so much that happens in the friction or in the space between them. And I really think now that you've said that, like I'm absolutely seeing that this novel thrives on, on sometimes the lighthearted or the uh, the anti humor approach, the anti hero hero type humor approach to these darker subjects, and how much of the successful parts of successful vibe of the novel comes from from those times. Um, I was also wondering though, just you mentioned having fun while you write and I made me think, I feel like that's one of those things that sustains you, you can sustain you as a writer. Like you would, I would never want to, yes, you, you know, yes, the kill your darling sentiment is important, I guess, in some ways, but I mean, we don't want to be mass murderers, you know, you want to like save some of the things that you love and that's what's going to make you want to keep coming back to the manuscript. Do you, do you, is that, does that resonate with you? Yeah. I mean, I also, I find that I, it's, very important for me to like have like so i come from the theater and in the theater as a playwright like you write the play and then you go into rehearsal and like you write the play alone and you think it's amazing and brilliant and then you go into rehearsal and it's just like day after day of realizing what doesn't work and like completely changing everything and i think there's a way that my training which is both playwriting and fiction has allowed me to think of like like there being like a generative hat and an and a revision hat um and so in that generative hat like the the sense of play is in, immensely necessary um because without it like i just don't write anything um and then with revision then it becomes much easier like especially giving myself a little time between those two periods it becomes much easier to go in and say like oh okay these are these are these are the darlings that that we're going to sacrifice um but also like for me it's always really important to identify what gave me the most joy and like what was the thing that i was like really excited about writing and couldn't wait to write and had a great time writing and then still love because often that i find is sort of where the emotional core of the project is 
Um, and so there were definitely choices that I made where like, um, where like my agent would be like, is this the right choice? And I would be like, I think so. <laughs> I'm not going to change it if it's the wrong choice. Well, it is. <laughs> um, but also because like the book ends up being made up of whatever those choices are. So if you let somebody, or if you decide to take out all of the fun, then there won't be any fun left for anybody, um, is my feeling. Yeah. I just wrote down a new piece of writing advice, which is identify your sacrificial darlings. Yes. That's my new way. That's my new way of phrasing that forever. Yeah. 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 All of that, all of that really like dumbly silly banter that I cut out. I felt so good cutting it out. Like I felt like I was making so much progress because I would just go in and be like slash one page gone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so there's a couple quick questions in the chat I want to run through real quick. So a second half of a question we didn't get to is, what is your schedule for writing? What are you an everyday person? Or are you a, uh, when you feel like a person? I'm, I'm, I say I'm an everyday person, but I also have a toddler. Um, and <laughs> so my, uh, my uh, schedule has become much more flexible in the last three years um, because there's always, you know, somebody has a fever or you know just really needs mom um i i write best in the mornings like in an ideal world my life is like get up make tea go sit down and write um that is not my life right now <laughs> um maybe in a few years um but so it's also been really important to learn to write in the cracks as well um like i had a i had a a, a teacher in grad school who said, like, I'm not going to ask you, I'm just going to ask you to write for two minutes every day. Like, that's all I'm asking is two minutes. So in that sense, I am a write every day person. But some days that's literally like, I'm at the playground and I write a sentence while the kids on the swing. And some days that's like, I sit down and I have five hours and I just go. So uh, another question from the chat. Uh, other than grad school, were you working on writing something other than Shim Sham? Um, Sh Sham Shine, Shim Sham. Yeah. I like Shim Sham though. I was like, Shim Sham. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, yeah, if there's a sequel, maybe it'll be Shim Sham. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I have continued to write plays throughout the entire process. Um, so like I had, I mean, since the pandemic, I have not really returned to theater, but I, but I did have a, a, a production up in 2019. Um, so like right before the at end of 2019, right before the pandemic. Um, and then now, now I'm working on something else that I don't really know what it is, but yeah, it seems like it's another novel. <laughs> So uh, this is an off the cuff question. I, I, you're a playwright. And I usually like to ask people when they're working in a couple genres or have other artistic influences, like how does playwriting inform your novel writing and maybe vice versa? Yeah, uh, so playwriting very well, playwriting and theater work in general very strongly informs my writing um, because I hear every sentence in a way that I think that um, that other fiction writers don't necessarily. Um, and also I have a, I have sort of a potentially a compulsion towards saying things as tightly as possible, <laughs> um, because in the theater, like you only have an hour and a half or two hours of, of time and all of the words are spoken out loud. So like a, a play is like, like 10 to 20,000 words, a novel is a hundred thousand words. So like, I'm used to trying to cram a lot into little space. Um, and I also think that like, that's part of my attraction to noir, um, comes out of like, because noir is a genre that all of the noir novelists, the original noir no novelists were also working in radio plays. And so it's very much a, a language that is, it, it, it's, it feels like it's meant to be spoken. Um, and so I think that that was also part of my original attraction to the genre. So that leads me to my next little line of questioning was sort of about scene and exposition and scene making obviously being so important in playwriting where that's all you get. Um, and I mean, unless you're throwing in a, an overbearing narrator, which I guess is fair, but um, uh, 
So this novel requires a lot of information. For example, before you read the section you read, which came from the middle, you had to explain some stuff that had you read the novel, you would have picked up more organically. Um, and this is the speculative conceits of how, how the, the pigments work. This is about the historical background of this alternate history that you've crafted. So there's a lot of stuff that you need to know. And I think you do a really great job of introducing that information organically as we go along. And it comes at a, it never, you know, we don't get like encyclopedia entries along the way. This just sort of comes very naturally through the course of, of the action within scenes, within, within, uh, I mean, there is exposition, but it's blended into, into the more scenic writing. So how do you balance sharing information or the exposition with writing a compelling forward moving scene? What, what was, what did you do to do that? And what was the, what were the challenges of doing that? There were many challenges. Yeah. Um, it was very hard. Um, I'm very glad to hear that, it, <laughs> that the, what, I, what I did resonated. Um, a couple of things. So when also that this is another place where like the playwriting background uh, helps and hinders in both ways, because I was like anti exposition, um, because in the theater, you just you just try to avoid it as much as possible. And so people were getting really confused by the world. Um, and so it took me a long time to try to figure out how to put exposition in without just like collapsing inside when I rewrote, reread what I'd written. <laughs> um, but one of the, I mean, a couple of things. One, one, of, one of my teachers in grad school was like, what's on the walls? Like what's hanging on the walls? <laughs> I was like, oh, I can use that. Um, and then starting to think of a lot of the exposition, like finding ways to fit the exposition in when Pratita, the main character, is trying to avoid thinking about something. So she's like, oh, I don't want to listen to this conversation. So I'm going to stare at that poster on the wall that explains the history of pigments, right? Um, like oh i don't want to i don't want to think about like my feelings so i'm going to turn on the radio and there's going to be a little news snippet that's going to sort of flesh out the world um and then also thinking about um when we when i felt like we needed full explanations and what things could just be referred to so like there are several references in the book to ration bars like that people will just have ration bars around um, and that's never, I never like, I'm never like, there are regular famines in this country that is, you know, broken into pieces by vast deserts of very strong emotion that people can't cross. Um, so, so sort of trying to pick, pick my battles that way about what was important for the reader to know, um, and what things could be dropped in and left for the reader to fill in with their with their own experience of the world and of other speculative worlds or other books i mean i think it's important here that sometimes it's just finding a device that allows you to address the thing that needs to be addressed with and there are organic devices that would, yeah so that and i like the when your character doesn't when your character can go there when it when they don't want to face an emotion for example so that's that's great too um so i think we have a Pretty hard question in the chat, and so I'm gonna throw it right away. How do you know? How did you know you were are a writer, and where does your belief and confidence come from? This is, well, this is hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it helped that my mother, who is on the screen, hi there, oh. um, <laughs> is also a writer. Hi, Mom. Uh, so I grew up with this idea of like, if you want to write, you just like you are a writer if you write. Like it, it is a thing that you become by doing, right? And so there was a way in which I was like, well, I can, I can put words together. Um, so that that was always that always felt like a possibility for me in a way that I I know like talking to a lot of my friends who are writers, it it wouldn't necessarily have felt like that for them. Um, but then also like again coming in through theater, I started as an actress. And as an actress, like you get told what to say, like you are literally given the words and then you say them. And that started feeling kind of icky. Like there was 
one semester in college where I was cast as four different rape victims, um, which was just like, oh, these are the only roles that are available to me. Um, and so then, then I moved into directing because I wanted to be able to pick what roles were getting put out there. And then, but I still wasn't finding the plays that said what I wanted to say. And eventually I was like, well, the reason I can't find the play that, I, that says what I wanted to say is because I have to write that play. And so once, once I made those jumps, which took, I mean, I'm talking about this like it was an obvious process, but it took about 10 years, um, then it was very easy to say, no, I'm a writer. Like, I won't be happy just dedicating myself to someone else's language and to someone else's point of view. As an artist, I need to be putting out what I am feeling and seeing. Um, and that took chutzpah, <laughs> um, but but one, once I did it, and then and then I had this this idea in the back of my head of like the way that you become a writer is that you write. Then it was much easier to just sort of be like, okay, no, this is what I do. This is how I do it. Um, I, I, to the if you, if you write, you are a writer. Amen to that. And then also your other comment. I was I had to Google the uh, Toni Morrison quote. If there's a book you want to read but it hasn't been written yet then you must write it yes. i feel that was yeah that was that's a great quote to follow too so excellent advice excellent answer that that really really good it's a great question but a tough one to answer so excellent a plus response thank um, you so next question from the chat how do you know which story or idea lends better as a play or a novel do you ever see them being both simultaneously that's interesting I, yeah, I mean, I knew this one was a novel um, from very early on because I wanted to play so much with 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 novel genre. Um, like I, I knew that I wanted I wanted it to be playing with the science fiction that I grew up reading and with the, you know, with the noir um, and 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 with that attention to language that so often as you, you find in, in literary fiction, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so I knew this one had to, be, had to be a novel, but honestly, it with, since starting this, like, or since really, really doing the deep dives after grad school that, that I did, it's been much harder to tell. <laughs> um, so like the last play that I started to write, um, I gave it to a few friends to read and they were like, yeah, it's really good. It reads like a novel, um, which is not a compliment about a play. <laughs> so I think that there's um... a compliment to me. I, accept. I, I would have been, I would have, also great. I would not have known. <laughs> I mean, I think that what they were pointing out was maybe that the, maybe what I was trying to write would work better in, in prose. Um, I think that there's a size issue like there's a way like you can never hold a whole novel in your head and a, a play you have to be able to hold in your head so there's sort of a a size um not in terms of like the like the vastness of emotion or catharsis that you're going for but in terms of the level of detail that you want to get into um that i think does does help me decide which is which you mentioned writing uh, poetry at least a little bit earlier, and do you write short fiction as well? I don't because I'm really bad at it, like really bad at it. <laughs> that's, inter I, that's interesting that like it feels like that play in short. I always feel like when I re see a movie of a novel, for example, like so much gets left out. I feel like the actual length, like short stories are the length of a movie. That's like the movie yeah. length content. And then we always go to novel because everyone knows novels, and so they get turned in. Like, why don't we just go to some stories? That's where the novel length writing is already, or the movie length writing is already happening. So I, I wondered if that's interesting. Are you yeah. really bad at them? I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I, you're a good writer, so I just have my doubts about about your claim that you're bad at them. Well, so here's the thing: is that I feel like the short stories that like gut me and stay with me forever are short stories that, in a way, it's they feel more like a portrait of a character than a fully plotted thing. Um, and I often can't find, like, I don't know my characters well enough to write the short story of them 
until I have written the novel of them. Like there's one, there's one chapter in Shamshine that actually at one point I pulled it out as like to do the exercise of like, could this be a, a short story excerpt from the book? And that was like one of the last things I wrote. <laughs> um, so, so I'm just, I'm just not, I, I, I'm not great at that, the sort of level of observation and creativity within that compact space within prose. Um, I think in theater, I, I feel, in theater, you, you're able to leave a lot more up to your collaborators. So you can, you can sort of sketch it out and they'll fill it in for you. <laughs> I hope my cat having an existential crisis isn't too loud in the background. Um, uh, so next question from the chat is to actually a, a request. Could you recommend a noir novel that was uh, most influential to you? I, yeah, I mean, well, I don't know if I can recommend one. Um, but many, many I is mean, fine. Many, I mean, Dashiell Hammett, um, just all of Dashiell Hammett. Um, also, so I believe that there, that noir influenced a lot of science fiction. Um, so if you look at like the work of William Gibson, um, I really think that he's drawing on like, especially like the early, um, Neuromancer in particular, obviously, um, and like Neuromancer was one that I was very much going back to often. Um, but like William Gibson, like, oh, I have a, a quotation from him somewhere um like he writes things like got my jacket and took the stairs three at a time straight out to the nearest bar in an eight-hour blackout that ended on a concrete ledge two meters above midnight which for me is just like you know like like uh very very noir um yeah my mother is charmin hilfinger to whoever asked that in the <laughs> I mean, I, I know, I think there's a blurb on the back that mentions Philip K. Dick, who was certainly another sci-fi author dabbling with the, the noir side of things. Uh, well, I don't know if that was someone else saying that or if that was something you believe too, but I, I see it. I don't well, see it. Was, it was yeah. Kim Stanley Robinson saying that. I, I don't know that I would, I, I would ever, like, it, Philip K. Dick is one of those writers where I'm like, I don't want to compare myself to him because I'll just get <laughs> writer's block forever. <laughs> so, well, Forget we ever mentioned Philip K. Dick. Kim Stanley Robbins is very nice, though. He, I didn't meet him, but he came to do an event at the Writer's Center, and everyone said he was very nice. He's so, great. He's um, great, yeah. Uh, so there was, uh, oh, I was going to ask, while we're on influences, I was curious about your curious about your sort of literary heritage, too. Is there, are there any things that we haven't mentioned outside of noir, maybe? Uh, I mean, what are the books that and the authors that really influence you, besides maybe the ones you mentioned? And also, are there any other books or authors that you feel that this particular novel is in conversation with? Because I think that's also a slightly different and interesting question. Yeah, so, um, I mean, this book in particular is very much in conversation with, uh, with Jasper Ford. Um, like when you talk about that fun uh, sort of, like he, his work, I don't know if anybody here has read his work, but he, he writes these books that they're like detective novels where the detective can go into a book um, and there's like corporate espionage where people are trying to like pull things out of works of fiction out of works of fiction um, and they're just wild like the only thing he does is has fun like the only rule of is that he has to be having fun and I really enjoy them there are times where you're sort of like well it would be great if there was like maybe a little a little more oomph to some of these but like he just gives himself permission. He's like, and now I'm going to write as if I'm writing Wuthering Heights. And my character is like stumbling into the background of scenes in Wuthering Heights. Um, so that was very much an early sort of like when I was like, just trying to get through the first draft, I was like, well, if Jasper Ford can get away with what he's doing, I can have all the fun I need. Mm -hmm. um, and then also like N.K. Jemison, um, her work uh, is a huge sort of like she was one of those one of those authors where like I found her and I was like oh people are taking theory ideas and they're putting them they're using them to make plot in fantasy novels um so like she's very much she she was a social worker and the dream blood duology is like based in Jungian psychology right um and then and then her her broken earth uh trilogy 
um, is just for me one of the most powerful, like it's just this incredibly powerful exploration of grief that happens to happen in a completely fantastical world, um, sort of grief and race relations. Um, so like she's always someone. And then Ursula Le Guin, of course, is always a person. The, the idea of like doing speculative work as as a way to be a realist of a larger reality has, has been something that really res has resonated with me always. Well, back to the chat. Did you fear writing a novel where the USA is so thoroughly defeated? Um, no, I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's been really interesting to me um, because for me, I wrote a book in which the United States is in a situation that's very similar to the situation that Argentina is in or the situation that Colombia is in in the real world. Um, and it's been really interesting to me that people often describe it as dystopian. And I'm like, this is a, like the main character is leading a middle-class life basically. Like there aren't cell phones or anything. And yeah, you know, there are probably regular famines, but like, it's, it's not a lot of what they're struggling with are things like there's, there's a, a foreign power that has military bases, a military base, you know, 20 miles south of where the main action of the of the book takes place the inflation is uh, is she at one point the main character talks about like the goal of two dig double digit inflation being a goal being a being something that people were worried about in the 70s as opposed to it being a goal in this world like inflation is rampant like here in Argentina inflation was over 100% in the last year um so the, a lot of what I brought in to the book were actually things that I that I have seen and lived with while I while I've lived in Latin America. Um, and like everybody, like things keep going in some way. Like there is a resilience that that I I think we don't know in the same way that like when the supply chain disruptions all happened during the pandemic, like we all figured out how to deal with the lack of toilet paper for a couple of weeks, right? Like there, there, there's, there, we have more um, resources than, than we think we do in each other and in the, in the world around us. I mean, in a way I was like, it's almost satirical to me. You're painting a satire I mean, and I mean, there is a to me there is a deep satirical element to the state of America in this book, and it's revealing sort of the truth of America. So the the not that far away from the like whether or not it's dystopian, it is not far. It's not as far away as you might think. This is like a, a step away, yeah. and it happens all around the world. So it's it's flipping America on its head and making it the making it the place that other people, the way we look at some other countries, making us the country that other people look at that way. So I thought it was a brilliant sat satirical twist. Um, Thank you. Another question, um, uh, are you a plotter, a pantser, or a planter? Someone asked what pantsers and planters were, so just real quickly, a pantser, a plotter is someone who writes, plans out a plot carefully. A pantser is someone who writes by the seat of their pants, so doesn't really do any advanced planning. And then the planter is someone who sort of maybe does a bit of both. So what, what so, are you? Uh, that is, so I, I have always found that question strange or that, co that construction strange because the first draft, I didn't know where, like, I didn't know where the book was going, but I knew the beats of the plot in the sense that I knew the rhythm of the noir, of the, of the mystery. Right. So it would be like, oh, they, they have to make a, like, oh, they, they just got in, in the car. They have to go make a big discovery we're, you know, we're, we're 90 pages in. So that's what has to happen. Right. Like, so I didn't necessarily know what was going to happen at every point, but I knew approximately how far away, I, like I knew, oh, in this chapter, like they have to stumble on a conspiracy. Oh, this chapter, they're going to have to, right. So there was a way that like, I had that 
model, that formula of the plot ingrained in me so much that I was writing by the seat of my pants, but I was filling in the beats in the plot that I already knew. That said, again, that first draft was really useful because it made me, it made it very easy. Like there was so much that had to change <laughs> after that first draft. Um, so like for the, like I, I referred to the, the two like really big in-depth rewrites of the, the last third and the first third, which I, ba I, I mean, I, I threw out, I, I probably threw out 70 pages of the last hundred and I probably threw out 60 pages of the first hundred in those two rewrites. And what those rewrites, what had to happen in those rewrites was I had to sit down and I had to plot out like, you know, this causes this, which causes this, which causes this. And, you know, oh, I have too many villains. I'm going to have to pull one of them out of the book. And so, so at the end of the day, I did end up doing both of those at the same time like i would you know i'd write out a two-page summary of like this is what this hundred pages is going to do and then i'd write the first third of the page and i would have already already realized that like oh that like oh i introduced this character which means that this character is going to have to have a confrontation with them at some point so um yeah i guess probably that means that i'm like an inveterate planter. <laughs> Um, uh, another follow up there. Do you think that those two big rewrites were necessary Did you see their point as, uh, as correct or did you follow their direction, not knowing if it would make the book better? It was like, both of those notes were like incredibly painful because they were what I was hoping nobody would notice. <laughs> um, like, I feel like, like one of the, the ways that I've been the most lucky with this book has been to work with people who can see what I'm trying to do and show me where I'm falling short on it. Um, so like both of those, when I got like, like as soon as my agent was like, yeah, it's not really thrilling. I was like, oh no, you're so right. Like <laughs> it ended with, yeah, it was just like not, it was not, it was not good. And I knew that. <laughs> Um, even though I, it, the last third had already survived four drafts, right? Um, and when the when the when Peter, my editor, said like the first third she doesn't do detecting, I was like, yeah, I I have noticed that she's incredibly passive through the, <laughs> the first hundred pages of the book. Um, so I mean, and that's like that that's something I think that like grad school and working in theater has been really helpful for me because it's given me a lot of opportunities to learn what notes are worth taking um, and to recognize the sinking feeling when you get the big ones that you really need <laughs> and learn there's how nothing, to like work through there's, them. <laughs> there's nothing as bad as, as someone telling you what you already know. That's the worst thing in writing. It's like you knew Absolutely. it in, in your soul. And it comes out and suddenly it has to leave. It's in, it's being ripped from your soul. It's in your soul, that knowledge. And it's ripped out and just shown to you on a piece of paper, <laughs> an email. It's in an email from someone. Like, email. Your, the darkest part of your soul in an email. Yeah. Uh, just one quick question from the chat. Uh, do you work with an editor prior to sending a draft to your agent or any writing partners or anything like that? So I have, uh, I'm married to a writer. Um, How's that working out? I, <laughs> really well <laughs> um, I mean really well because we have this balance where we both are reading each other's work and 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 it's a balance that we are constantly negotiating um I think in the same way that like housework is something that you have to constantly negotiate in a in a family situation and like parenting like everything has to be constantly checked in and made sure that nobody's taking on more than they feel good with. Like we're always, you know, one night I say, I need to read this to you. Do you have time? And then the next night he'll say like, I have something, can we read it? Um, and sometimes it's like a month where it's mostly his work and a month where it's mostly my work. But um, so in that sense, I do, you know, and I also send things to my mother um, <laughs> still. Um, but so like, I do have these two like, very trusted 
people who can look at my work. And one of my friends talked about it as like spinach in your teeth. Like you read it to your, to your, these people or you have them read it so that they can be like, yeah, don't send it yet. <laughs> I, I love, I love that metaphor. That's great. So I, we're right at the end of the end of the end of our time. So I do want to go to our final question that we always, that I always like to end with at least, which is what's one piece of advice you'd give to a writer just starting out? Find your people. Like I think and marry that, them. and marry them. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's been great. It's been fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah. But and like find your people and also like maybe marry them in other ways too. Like I have a lot of friends where like they have their like two people and they're not, you know, making children with them. Um, <laughs> but, but finding people who like, it may not be that they love the same books that you love or that they, they read the same things that you read, but like that they are champions for your work with you and are there to buck you up and are also there to sit you down when you need it, when you need some real um, solid advice. And like, I often find that like when I, there, like when I get those big notes, there's a sinking feeling, but there's also an unlocking feeling. So if you can find the people who can give you the like bad news, that then gives you a new idea and pushes you in a new direction. Like grab them, hang on to them, never let them go. <laughs> that's that's excellent advice. And I just wanna thank you so much for coming us. Everyone, please uh, get a copy of The Sham Shine Blind if you're able from your local independent bookseller from bookshop.org or your local library or wherever possible. Uh, Paz, thank you so much for joining us. This was a really wonderful chat. I hope everyone else enjoyed it as much as me. And for everyone else, we hope we'll see you again next week. We'll be back here for another virtual craft chat. So uh, it's been fun. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.